All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, my name is Caroline. I'm with Chalkbeat. We're super thrilled you're here. Um, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping items, and then I'm going to turn it over to our amazing students. Um, so thank you all for joining. We are um, really excited for this conversation. So we have a really amazing Spanish translation room uh, available to you all. Um, so please take a moment. Uh, there are instructions both in English and Spanish on how to join. Uh, so thank you to our interpreters and please take advantage of that service. We're really excited to offer it and let us know if you have any questions. Um, so please use the, the chat if you have any questions. Uh, if you have any issues, know that we're monitoring it um, and we'll definitely answer any questions you have there. We're also going to have a time for audience questions for our students at the end of um, of this session. And so we'd love for you to submit audience questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so chat box, if you have any issues or if you have any comments, we'll be prompting you all to kind of make this feel a little bit more uh, like we're all in the same room together. So use the chat box for comments and use the Q&A uh, for any questions for our student panelists. And we'll be, be watching that. Um, so I do want to take a moment to go, say, go ahead and say to our, our audience members, Take a minute to introduce yourself in that chat box. Tell us your name, uh, what you do, um, and one word to describe how you're feeling right now. We're going to ask the same thing of our student panelists here in, in just a second. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to a couple of students who are going to introduce the groups that, we're, that, uh, that we're, are, they are affiliated with and the groups that are represented today. Before I do that, I do want to give a shout out to the Gates Family Foundation and Colorado Education Initiative for making this possible. Um, but uh, students should introduce their groups and I'm excited to let them do that. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Ana Luisa, who's gonna introduce the Colorado Youth Congress for us. Good morning, my name is Ana Luisa Cervantes. I'm a rising senior at Stride Prep Smart High School and I'm also a member of the Colorado Youth Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. As you all know, it's a stressful time for students, but I believe when educators are able to authentically partner with students, we find the best solution. A little bit about the Colorado Youth Congress. We're a community of high school leaders across the state working to create systems change. This summer, we surveyed over 1,000 students to get their perspective on what issues are most important to them. And the top two issues by far were mental health and racial justice. I'm excited to address these topics today. Thank you for being here. And now I would like to introduce Gracie from YASPA. Hi guys, um, my name is Gracie. I would like to first just apologize. There's craziness going on in my house, so I'm sitting outside. So I'm sorry for any background noises that you may hear. Um, but I am a intern for this wonderful organization, YASPA. Um, the only way that I find fit to introduce what YASPA is, is to go off of experience. Um, so for about two and a half years, I've been working for YASPA. And um, it's basically a nonprofit that has been made up of multiple councils of youth that have led the conversation. It has given us an outlet to use our student voices in order to tackle issues that we have found important and serious in our, in our schools or in our community. It ranges basically whatever students feel that they need to speak on, YASPA gives them a platform in order to do that. Um, now with that said, um, I would now like to pass it off to Erica from Chalkbeat to introduce herself and the webinar. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm Erica Meltzer. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Colorado. We're a nonprofit news organization dedicated to covering education through a lens of equity. And um, I want to give a big thank you to uh, Colorado Youth Congress and YASPA and to the students for lending us their time and expertise. And of course, a big thank you to the Gates Family Foundation and the Colorado Education Initiative for their support of this event. Um, I'm also the parent of um, two Denver Public School students. So I am, I am living this along with everyone else. And um, I'm really excited to see so many people from around the state um, serving in so many different 
education roles, uh, joining us today to hear from these students. I think, um, I think we're all a little tired of the word unprecedented, um, but it is hard to come up with another word to describe the times that we're living through uh, from when the first um, definitive case of COVID was identified in Colorado to when schools shut down uh, just a few weeks passed, and now many of our students are, are facing returning to school remotely in the fall. I was talking to a teacher the other day who was saying, when it comes to education policy, a lot of people have opinions. We've, every single one of us has been a student at some point. Many people who work in the policy realm were once classroom teachers. But when it comes to the experience of remote learning, there's really only two people, two groups of people that have experienced this, and that's the teachers and the students. The legislators, the policymakers, they weren't there in the Zoom, in the Zoom rooms trying to make this work. And um, Colorado Youth Congress shared with me some survey data that they collected. They talked to more than 1,000 students around the state, and just 4.4% of them were consulted before online learning was rolled out, and a quarter of students were never asked for any feedback at all about what their experience was like. And almost half of students said they were missing at least one resource they needed to complete schoolwork, and they identified missing their friends and social interaction, uh, mental health, and lack of support for college preparation as um, some of their top concerns. So we're hoping to rectify today um, we're hoping to rectify today some of uh, that gap that was created when students weren't asked about their experiences and um, really look, for look forward to hearing from them today. And with that, I am going to kick it off and I'm gonna ask each of the students in turn to tell us um, their name, uh, where they're from, uh, their community and their school and what grade they're in and a word to describe how they're feeling today. Hi, my name is Sierra. Um, I'm from Dr. Martin Luther King Junior Early College. And a word to describe how I'm feeling, I'm feeling happy to express how we feel to you guys about um, our passionate feelings toward virtual learning. My name is Angel. I go to DMF Faith um, Early College. I live in the Bible community. And a word to describe your influence here is very productive. Hi, my name is Angie Gonzalez. I go to Glenwood Springs High School um, in Glenwood Springs. And a word to describe what I'm feeling right now is excited to share my thoughts and concerns and to have people listening and really taking into consideration what we're saying. Hi, my name is Omar al -Tayb. I go to DSSC Mont View, and a word to describe how I'm feeling would be excited. Uh, I feel excited just to, like, be as a student, just to show my thoughts to teachers and uh, people across the state. Hi, well, this is Caroline from Chalkbeat. I'm just going to hop in and say we're shutting off the chat, uh, and we do have someone who's attending who's not, shouldn't be here. Uh, so just know that the chat is shut off, shut off uh, and please continue, everyone. Kelly, go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Kelly. I'm from Denver. I go to DSSP College View. I'm, uh, I'm going up into junior year, and um, I'm nervous, but I'm very excited about sharing uh, my opinions. <laughs> My name is Anna. Um, I'm a rising senior at Strive Smart. And the word to describe myself right now is I'm feeling pretty calm. Um, my name is Amy. I'm from Holyoke, and I go to Holyoke Senior High School. Um, I'm going into senior year and I feel anxious and kind of concerned, but also encouraged by the fact that we're able to have this discussion. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Zoe Gallup. I go to Sunup High School in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I think I, I'm a sophomore. And one word to describe how I'm feeling is hopeful, because I feel that this um, conversation and panel right now will hopefully bring some light to issues that are going on with students and you know, students with boys and what's going to happen with this upcoming. Hello, my name is Ashley Garcia, and I'm a rising senior at Gateway High School. Um, I currently am feeling grateful for the opportunity to speak to everyone here today. Hi, uh, my name is Gracie. I am a rising senior at Vista Peak, and I too am feeling very hopeful and grateful um, to get my voice out there and my message across. Did we get everybody? I think we did. Um, so thank you for that. I wanna start uh, with a reflection question. Um, when in-person school started, uh, excuse me, when in-person school stopped last semester, what was that like for you? And what do you wish your teachers and school had done differently? And I'm gonna start with, uh, with Angie for this one. Um, for me, it was really sudden and um kind of well just really not unexpected but obviously it was really shocking um and i thought it was just going to be for a couple of weeks at first and then everything kept getting extended and all the deadlines and i kind of wish that um the classes were more um like the same level like some classes were signing a lot of work still other classes were barely signing any some were having zoom calls um, on certain days and others weren't having any of that type of interaction. So I, I kind of wish it was all more stable and more, um, they were like following the same guidelines. Um, and I understand that it was all sudden for everyone, but I think it was really um, like kind of unstabilizing in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that reflects a lot of people's experiences. Um, Angel, how does, that, how does that resonate with your experience? Um, at first, I didn't think too much of it because, you know, I just thought it was going to be, like Angie said, for a couple of weeks, but it turned into the rest of the year and potentially the beginning of this year. And it was very shocking, like Angie said, because I've, like, never done anything like it, and it was very unexpected and overall just really overwhelming, I feel like, for both teachers and students. And Zoe... Um... How, what was that like for you when school when school stopped and how do you wish what do you wish had been different um so when school stopped it was very sudden and our first notice was that it was only going to be three weeks and then about four days into that it turned into the whole school year and i think it was very frustrating because i was already struggling with school and needing extra help and i think that the fact that some of my teachers just didn't communicate with us or our teachers were using kind of different platforms where not everything was getting communicated. It was extremely frustrating and I feel that it wasn't helpful that they were all using different platforms. I think that maybe if they were all to all use some sort of thing to communicate students, whether that be Google Classroom, Zoom, or um, schools, Schoology, I think that would, that would have been a lot more helpful. And I think if teachers all started to kind of work and be consistent with their schedules. And, and uh, this is to the three of you. For those who've, who are starting remotely, are you hearing about things that are going to be different this fall that you think are an improvement from the spring? So um, we're Sure. We're starting half remotely, half in person, but we're having an option to go full online. And we have had no communication on what our classes are going to look like or any schedules or what options 
school going to be like. And Angel or Angie, did um, have you heard of any improvements? Um, or are you feeling like it's gonna be more of the same? I had heard from one of my teachers that uh, DPS intends to make more use of Schoology just because it's more accessible to everybody and it has more um, virtual tools that we could all use and like we wouldn't all have to be on like multiple different platforms to like confuse people if that makes sense. So we're gonna be entirely remote um, until like September 21st at least I think. Um, and we haven't really heard about schedules or um, exactly how, uh, like how Zoom calls are gonna be structured in what order and uh, how much homework is gonna be distributed and stuff. So we just know that it's gonna be virtual um, and that's about it. That sounds frustrating. Um, our next question, we're gonna start with Ana Luisa for this one. What do you want your teachers and school leaders to know about your life right now? What's going on behind the scenes? Um, I wish teachers knew how messy everything is. Like, um, like we don't just go to school. We also have like different things happening and everything is constantly changing. So what I wish teachers knew is to like, let us know what's happening in advance. Like, um, I'm not sure what it'll look like um, this next semester, but last semester, everything was super last minute. Like um, I'd get an email from the teacher like, oh, tomorrow you have a Zoom meeting at this time, but I have something else planned at that time. So I had to change everything. And it was just like, it, it gets a lot. So I think um, just knowing that everything is changing and that like carefully planning things is what we would like um, teachers to do just so we know what's happening and just so we don't add more chaos into our lives. Kelly, um, what would you like your teachers and and administrators to know? Um, I agree with Anna Luisa and also like just to know that like um, right now we have just so much going on that it might be hard to get student engagement and like just motivation from many students um, just because of how chaotic uh, everything is like from the pandemic to like the movement and everything just seems to be piling on and even the little things seem a little much. So just acknowledging that like students are probably not gonna be a hundred percent um, especially with starting school again remotely and just trying to understand that like we're trying <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah, I think um, I've been hearing the word grace uh, used a lot for what we need to extend to each other and uh, it sounds like students could use that from their teachers. Um, Sierra, have you, does that um, resonate with you? Are there, are, um, are there other things going on for you that you would like teachers to know? Yeah, I actually agree with Kelly. Um, there's a lot of disengagement that I would want teachers to know about that um, many students, not just myself, feel. And I feel like with that disengagement, it revolves into a lot of um, miscommunication and misconception and um, unmotivation. So I really agree with Kelly with that. And Omar. And um, Omar's gonna uh, be our last student on this question. What would you like your teachers and administrators to know about what's going on in your life? Uh, our students just like knew like that, like school isn't like our only priority, that there could be family, like problems or family issues or just like stuff in our personal lives. And I wish like teachers could understand that better so they could just like be, uh, put them in our shoes and just like, oh, we can not put this, all this work on them. We shouldn't like stress them out. We should talk to them more and like just stuff like that. And I think it will like boost the student more, give them more motivation. And I think that could be a great step to like helping them with learning. Absolutely, thank you all. Uh, our next question is um, for students who are going back, whether they're going back um, remotely or they're going physically back to the school, 
how are you feeling about that choice? Um, do you feel like it was the right decision? Um, do you have, do you have doubts? And um, what all is coming up for you? And we're going to start this one with Amy. Um, here in Holyoke, we're going back in person uh, on the 19th. And we're, we're going back full in person the full day, but we have to do the screening and we have to wear masks. And I think it's a good choice because we haven't had too many cases in, in this town. So I'm not worried about the health risks necessarily, but they are taking a lot more precautions. So I'm a bit concerned as to how the day is going to be let out, how classes are going to be structured. Um, and we haven't had much conversation on that and teachers haven't really communicated that to us or our parents. Um, so I think there's just a lot of stuff up in the air that I personally would like cleared up and I know that a lot of other students would as well. Um, but also very aware that it's, it's not a definitive answer for the teachers either. So I think we're all just at an understanding at the moment that none of us really know what's going to happen. But um, I'm feeling optimistic about it, so hopefully it'll work out. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, and Angel, gonna pass it to you on this one. So, uh, like I already mentioned, DPS decided that we're gonna be remote for all first quarter. And I know my sisters start on the 18th, I start on the 24th. And for me personally, I feel like it's both good and bad because, you know, I like picked up a lot of different things that I was doing. So if school were to come back, I would like have to balance my time more because I just have less time for things. But also thinking about like all students and those who are in less fortunate situations, such as not having access to the right technological materials or being like in abusive or toxic homes, um, it can be most definitely harder for them. And especially with this being online, I know it's going to be definitely overwhelming for the teachers and students because I can just imagine that there are being technical difficulties and like um, Sierra and Kelly mentioned earlier, disengagement. Students are not going to come back the way that we were in um, the March before we left and we're definitely not going to be as invested in our education, especially since we're all home. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, uh, Zoe and you're all, I believe you're also going back to school. You said you said, but you said you're going on a hybrid, part-time plan. Um, Zoe. Zoe I'm sorry, Zoe, we're having everyone. And so what that I've chosen is to go to school two to week online because I didn't do I'm sorry, Zoe, we're having a really hard time hearing you. You're breaking up a lot. Um so I'm gonna um I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on to um, to Gracie. I'm sorry. Um. So my school for the first quarter, at least, we're all online. Um. And with being online, it. Hold on. Um. The most challenging part has been communication with the school only because we start this Tuesday. Our school has not reached out to us about what school is going to look like, what scheduling is going to look like. Um, I don't even know who my teachers are next year or what time I'm supposed to log on. Um, my main thing is if we're going online, it's fine. I would prefer it because of the health risks of going to school and being in person and if it makes people more comfortable to stay at home as opposed to being at school I totally 100% understand that but there should be a grace period for communication so that students who do need resources or students that 
need to prepare or, you know, like how other students have said who are in bad situations, whether that's in a mental sense or in a home sense, um, you know, they need time to prepare. So it shouldn't, school shouldn't be a last minute decision and it shouldn't be last minute for students either. And that's kind of my doubt as far as going online because even with school not even starting it, even when it's this close, it's very hard for me to trust the admin with the rest of my senior year when they haven't communicated to me at all. Um, this so much doesn't have to do with educators because I really feel for them. They have a lot on their plate. Um, it more has to do with the admin and their lack of communication with the students and the parents. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to address what happened earlier. We obviously, we thought we had some protections in place and obviously some people got in um, to the conversation that shouldn't have been here and um, they are removed. The chat is locked, but, and we're still working to remove the comments if, um, and so I'm, we're really sorry that those were displayed for as long as they were. If you're still seeing those, you can go up, um, on the top, it says view and you can choose closed chat. So then at least you're not um, seeing that. And I, I again, I, I very much apologize um, that that happened. Um, and you can still use the Q&A um, to submit questions and, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, this has already come up a bunch on the call and, and it's been identified over and over again that that student mental health and the need for social connection was one of those things that did not get addressed the way that it should have during the during remote learning. And of course, we didn't just have a pandemic. We also had um, a major social uprising against police violence and, and racism while students were in this disconnected um, environment. And so I wanted to ask students what they think that schools can do um, to support their, mentor, support their mental health and provide social connection in a remote environment. And I'm gonna ask Omar to start start us off with this one. Uh, hi, uh, what's it called? I think that like, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement having an uprising again against police brutality, uh, I think black mental health also should be like a priority because black students like, they obviously don't feel safe in school and like DPS, they cut off their relationship with the police department which I think was a good step forward. But I think we could also like have, cause like, at least for my school, we, we have one black teacher out of like 200 staff members. And I don't think that's like a, like a good thing. So I think black mental health is definitely vulnerable, but also just mental health in general. Uh, I think with no socializing, people being quarantined and not seeing their friends and stuff, I think that takes like a deep hit at students. So I think they like teachers, what they can do is like have check-ins, like like after school during the weekends, like just like, how are you? Uh, what's your situation? And like, just like, how are you feeling pretty much? I think that could just make the student feel more motivated and like, oh, the teacher's there for me. Like, let me be there for them. Thank you. And that's a just a good reminder that um, a lot of these issues that students are reckoning with, they, they go back before COVID and they'll still be with us after COVID and, and remain just as important. Um, Sierra, do you wanna um, follow on that? Yeah, I feel like, I know me personally, I kind of relied on sports and things in that nature to kind of get my mind off reality. But since I know that spot or most sports aren't launching as soon as we plan them to, um, another resolution we can have is um, having students rely on clubs that they're interested in. Um, so since it's still like conveying their interest while those clubs are actually there to support them mentally and maybe admin could um, support them financially so the clubs have um, the availability to actually host events, you know, and do things that would actually interest the students so they could socialize and things of that nature while still checking up on them. Thank you. Ashley? Um, I agree with everything that was just said. I feel like one of the biggest things that our schools can do 
is um, provide more therapists for the students. I feel like this is an issue that has always been here, always been present within our communities, that many students don't feel as if they have the right to seek mental health aid if that's what they need. Um, I feel like if teachers were there to ensure, to let students know that it is okay to look for help in terms of mental health. Um, it is okay to not be okay sometimes if teachers were to really allow students to understand that, if there were more open conversations about this on a daily basis, or at least a regular basis, having those resources so that students don't feel as lost. I feel like that would all be greatly beneficial to our students and elevate um, everything that we need. Thank you. Um, and how I want to know how your school is communicating with you right now. What do you need from them that you're not getting? And I'm actually going to weave in um, a question that came in through our Q&A that's related to this, um, because a lot of students were saying that um, they haven't heard really basic information about teachers and class structure. And I think one of the questions was, is it possible that um, that parents have heard and, and do our parents communicating with kids? I can say that personally, there's a lot that I'm still waiting for as a parent. Um, but as, as you answer this question, if, um, you know, if, if you could speak to that as well, um, that would be great. And I'm going to start with Angie. So, um, like I said earlier, um, we've been getting like emails sporadically about how the school year is going to look. And I think we've only had like two or three really telling us, Hey, like school's going to be online. And then just recently, like, Hey, this is what orientation looks like and these are the days kids can come collect Chromebooks and stuff but that's about it um I know my mom tried to show me an email the other day but I had already read it because it came to me as well so um mm -hmm. I don't think parents are getting the information either it's not just that they're not communicating with their kids but that they're just also not receiving any information from the schools um but yeah uh, it's really basic communication, I think, that we're receiving and nothing really going into depth about our classes or how schedules are really going to look like and how um, homework is going to be required and what the guidelines are going to be. And Kelly, um, it, is that similar to your experience and how does that affect how you sort of your mindset as you approach the start of the school year? Um, yes, I'm also experiencing something very similar where all of our communication is very vague um, or they're like trying to like put it off until as close to as school starts. Um, and it's very overwhelming because <laughs> it feels like we're just like diving into the unknown and just like it kind of feels like their school is just kind of like forcing us to go with the flow and there's not really a flow to go with. Um, so it's very overwhelming and it feels very stressful. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like very vague communication or like they're just pushing it off until it's close to school starts and it's not very helpful. Um, thank you. A couple, of our, a couple of our folks are having um, some internet difficulty, which I think is something we've all experienced over the last couple months. So we'll bring them back as, hopefully as soon before the end um, of the panel. Um, the related question, the first day of school is right around the corner. Um, do you know what your day is gonna look like and what are the big questions you still have about, um, about just your day-to-day -day life during the school year? And we're gonna start with Omar for this one. Uh, I really don't even know how my day's gonna look like. Uh, I haven't got a schedule yet, I don't know. Like if we we're like doing like how the call is gonna work and like what we're doing like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and stuff, and I think they're just like miscommunicating that a lot. Uh, I was supposed to like they posted when to get the community computers on Instagram and like I didn't even see it because I don't follow the uh, account, and then so I missed it. And then like it's just like a lot of miscommunication. So I think. That's where like there's gonna just be a huge barrier where students are like not understanding what to do or how to do it. So I think that's a big fault. Okay. Um, Ana Luisa, do you do you know what your first day is gonna look like, and what questions do you have? 
So the thing with me is like something I noticed is every year prior to like COVID and remote learning, around this time, I knew what classes I I was gonna take like I was like okay the, this is what my course looks like and for some reason this year I can't even see it on my infinite campus which is really weird and I have only had one teacher communicate to me and he was like super clear on the supplies we needed on like what he was gonna teach us how it was gonna look like so I really appreciated that from him because um, he sent the email like a week ago and he's preparing us for what his class is gonna look like but I've I haven't had any other teacher reach out to me or and I have no idea what other classes I'm taking other than his class. And Ashley, does that is that similar to your experience? Um, yes, it is. Um, I as of right now, I do not have a class schedule, so I'm not sure what classes I'm going to be taking. And as an IB student, I'm not sure um, how my tests are going to be orient orientated during like the end of the school year. Um, I do not know what's going to be happening with the SAT. Um, there's been a huge lack of communication um, for the actual classes. There's been some communication with the admin and the students as to like how to communicate. Um, which sounds weird, but they've been asking us how to like contact their teachers and stuff like that. But in terms of the classes themselves, I have little, t I have yet to hear much except from a few teachers. I still do not know what's going to be happening with the scheduling. And um, I'm just extremely concerned for how my tests are going to happen since I am an IB student and my IB program at my school is going to be defunded from now on. We are no longer continuing that. And so I would really like to leave the school having my IB credits and ensuring that although we are no longer having the opportunity for my peers, that we at least got to have it while it was still there. Thank you. Um, and Amy, do you know, do you feel like you know what your day is going to look like and what questions do you still have? Um, yeah, I've been fortunate enough to get my schedule, but there was a lot of mix up with that because we've had a lot of staff turnover and we've gotten a new principal and a new counselor. Um, and so a lot of the schedule was mixed up. There's a lot of miscommunication and confusion. Um, so I'm I know what classes I'm taking, but I don't know who all my teachers are because a lot of the teachers have changed as well. Um, and on the first day of school in past years, we've had a giant assembly with the entire school. Um, and obviously we can't do that this year. So I feel like a lot of questions that especially um, junior higher, seventh graders going into junior high and then freshmen going into high school. In high school, siento, no sabemos esas transiciones, cómo van a pasar. Entonces, hay muchas preguntas acerca de esas transiciones. Um, so I think we had a cross with the interpretation. Um, it, it briefly came into the other call, just a heads up. Thank you. Um, I see we also see that we got um, Zoe back. And I wanted to ask you this question, too, since we kind of met. It's similar to the one that we, we kind of lost you on. Um, you know, do you have, do you know what your first day of school is going to look like? Do you, what questions do you still have as we prepare for the start of school? ¿Aún tienes preguntas acerca del comienzo de clases? Um, Okay, I think we don't have Zoe. I'm gonna go. Um, okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Well, we can come back to that question. Um, I'm just gonna ask um, for anyone to weigh in who wants to weigh in on this, since we're actually um, running ahead of schedule. Um, is there a silver lining for you in all of this, and what is giving you hope right now? Um, and just feel free to jump in on this and we'd like to hear from as many of you as possible. Um, I think, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, my thing is, it's my senior year. So um, I feel like um, I just have to make the most out of it. Like obviously this isn't the ideal situation and I won't have a traditional senior year, but at the end of the day, like 
we don't have any control over it and I'm almost done with high school. So I think that's just kind of what keeps me motivated. Thank you. Um, and Kelly, I think you were gonna, you had something as well. Uh, yeah, um, for me, school has always been a distraction for me. So being able to go back into that groove of having like somewhat decently good deadlines and actually doing work and being productive um, will be my silver lining just cause I need work to stay motivated and stay productive. So yeah. Yes, I agree. I feel like I'm sorry, but um, I agree. no go for it. Um, I feel like something that's given me hope is being able to be productive independently, since I can't really depend on schools to like connect me and help me with my networking. I'm excited to kind of do that on my own now and kind of reach out for certain opportunities by myself. So that's something that kind of gives me hope. Thank you. Any other silver linings? Uh, something that gives me hope is like last week I was invited to be a on be on a panel for my school. I was just pretty much like, oh, like what can we do better? And so it just gave me hope in the sense, oh, they're trying to get, they're trying to make change, they're trying to like be better. So I guess that was like a sign of hope for me. That they were that they were listening to your perspective and trying to improve it. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, move to some audience questions. And again, um, to get to as many questions as possible, um, we'll probably just, um, you know, have two students weigh in on each one and, um, you know, feel free to, to jump in on the question that speaks to you. And the first question is from Ali Kimmel and we've had a lot of versions of this question. Um, what were aspects of remote learning that were positive in the spring that you'd like to see replicated or that other teachers could learn from? Um, something I saw that I liked um, in our remote learning was I remember um, most of my teachers wouldn't have like mandatory Zoom meetings, if that made sense, because I know that a lot of them look like um, cross with each other where like I have um, a Zoom meeting for one class at the same time with the Zoom meeting for another class. So teachers would have communication to make sure there wasn't any um, misconceptions with that. So students would have like one thing they would focus on. Also, they would give like explanation videos on what we would be doing for either that day or that week. And if we did have questions, there would be a platform we should go to, but it wasn't mandatory in that sense. So that's something I like. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that. It was office hours that um, teachers consistently had every day. And it was really helpful because it was for multiple, maybe around like an hour and a half of teachers. I know it could possibly be inconvenient, but it honestly really helps me because I knew that for an hour straight, I could log in whenever I need to, to ask questions and get an answer instantly rather than waiting for an email and things of that nature. I liked for mine, um our teachers did like what we were going to do that whole week. So they would list out the days and then under in like a different doc that you could access on Schoology, it had um, what you were going to do um, for each day on, of that week and what was going to be due. So I think that was like a really good way for like kids to plan and prepare because of how unstructured everything else was that would provided like a sense of structure that you could um, base your week off of. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what do you all think are, what are the things that you all are talking about all the time amongst each other that you feel like are not part of the adult conversation that you don't think your parents or your teachers are thinking about? Um, so me and my friends have been talking a lot about how it feels kind of rushed where they're like, where they're, how they are transferring from e-school to school in real life and how like it's just kind of like overwhelming and we're all super worried about like our teachers and our peers and how it's even going to happen 
So I feel like um, it's like, it's scary to think about like if we go back and something happens. So like there's no concrete way that we are being told how our school's gonna be and that we're gonna be safe. And it's scarier to see like people, like schools that have already opened or other schools planning to open saying things like teachers are writing wills and stuff like that. Like that's very overwhelming. So it's like, how are we gonna keep students safe if we're gonna go back to school? Like that isn't just because the economy is crashing and school contributes so much to the economy. It's like, how do we keep students safe first and foremost, but also like keep students mental health well and like make sure that students are okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, are, what, does anyone else want to weigh in on this? Sort of what are the conversations that are really dominating your conversations with each other? I think for me personally, a lot of my friends have talked about how in our town, there seems to be so much of a concern for whether or not students are getting enough social interaction, which is good, but it seems like with the parents' focus on whether or not we're um, being socially active, it's whether we, we want a little more focus on whether or not we can return to school safely. And I think they're pushing so much that we need to get students back into school and we need to get students interacting with, with each other, which is true. Um, but we also need to take into account that we want to be able to go back with some normality, I guess. Like we want to be able to go back to school and stay in school, not go back to school and have to be back online in a month or two because they didn't take the precautions that were needed. Um, and they had a makeup prom um, in our town this past Saturday. And I didn't end it, but I think a lot of my friends and I talked about how it was a health concern that they had that large group of people. There were no mandatory masks. And I think that the um, focus on the social is kind of interrupting the social, the focus on health. And I think there needs to be a balance there. And it's not so much our the concern for our mental health that needs to be at the forefront, but both our mental and our physical um, should be quite equal. Thank you for that. And I think, I think from both of those comments, um, we've seen a lot of, I think, scolding of young people for spending time together. And I think that's a really nice um, corrective and an additional nuance to the conversation. Um, that's also a great segue for another question that we've gotten about, um, you know, whether, whether it's in-person opportunities or online, like what kinds of socialization opportunities do you, um, do you want? Like what would, what would sort of healthy and helpful social outlets look like um, without bringing a lot of people together um, in a way that creates a, a safety concern? Has anyone um, participated in something that was, that was, um, beneficial that you'd like to see replicated during school or um, or have an idea of what that could look like? So I know in my school, um, some jeans and some um, RJs we had, they would um, pull students out for things like walks or bike rides to just help them get their mind off of things and just talk out their feelings. And um, that was very beneficial. I wasn't a part of it, but that was very beneficial for the students that um, were a part of it because they were, um, lacking that social aspect. And then like Sierra said, with like um, being involved in the clubs, like I've been heavily involved with the Black Student Alliance at my school. And it's provided a lot of um, social um, interaction, but like in a safe way, because I'm like, I'm still healthy and I'm still safe. Yeah, I'm still getting that social aspect. And I believe that like, we should have more things like that. Like you could have home visits, you could, like I said, bike rides or walk with students while providing them that social interaction while still being safe, because it is very hard right now and both our physical and mental health are extremely important and delicate. Thank you, those are great examples. Anyone else have ideas on this? Um, something similar to what Angel said, um, 
I actually participated in like an internship for YASPA. Um, and it was like a summer group where um, a small group of people were able to meet and have discussions about things that we don't necessarily get to talk about in school, um, things relating to race, social justice. I feel like that's something that we really deserve to have in our schools. So to see something similar to that in our schools, like groups where we can do it online, um, have small groups meet in person even, and not even just speak about like these hardcore subjects, but even just speak and have an opportunity to just get stuff off your mind and meet at parks and get to play soccer or do something small. So having small groups where you get to discuss important things, I feel like that would be really interesting to see um, incorporated into school. Thank you. Um, we're seeing, um, in a lot of school plans, we're seeing a lot of things go by the wayside that are really important to students, whether it's art or music or athletics. And um, I, I think many of us have that thing that the, the real reason we came to school was this other activity that, we, that was so important to us. Um, do you all have um, interests or hobbies or clubs that, that have been, that you've had to let go of because of this? And are there ways that schools could still support those interests? Um, even if they're, you know, even if we're not, um, even if we have this altered school environment. So um, I was in choir for um, my third year before we went um, remote learning. And then when we did go remote learning, we didn't do like virtual choir um, classes. We just had like, short uh, lessons around like either reading music or learning about someone in the history of music. So I think what Ashley was saying like in terms of small groups, um, activities like that such as playing an instrument or singing or even if some schools have dancing or art, it should be given in a small group setting so we can still stay, stay safe but still have access to that thing we love. Because most of the time, those are things, like you said, that motivate kids to come to school. Thank you. Oh, I think something for school that was, like, super big was, like, the basketball season. Like, me and my friends, we were, like, all planning and looking forward to that. And then they pushed the football season to March, so we're like, oh, they're probably going to push the basketball season. But then these rumors started coming up, and we're like, oh, basketball season's going to get canceled and stuff. So we're like, like it's just going to suck. And then, so like a lot of people just like were kind of mad and stuff. And I think that was like a demotivator because people were like looking forward, like they had a motivation to like keep working until January, until like spring so they could get that. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, um, looking at another question here. Um, we've had a question about um, what type of physical environment is helpful when, um, when you're doing remote school. I know some students don't have a, a good place to work at home. There's been talk about whether we need to set up space at community centers. Um, what kind of physical environment has been helpful and, and what can schools be doing to make sure students, all students have that kind of physical environment? for learning. Um, I think a good uh, physical environment would be anywhere that you could feel comfortable um, learning, like having a quiet space, um, a stable internet connection, um, and like access to whatever you need to write in calculators and stuff like that, because I know um, some students really use all the materials provided to them at schools. And now that, at least for me, the school's not gonna be um, in person. Kids are probably gonna have struggle, like maybe finding a quiet space if they have siblings they're gonna have to take care of at home and stuff, or just finding a good place that has a good internet connection. So I just, places that are gonna have um, things that they need. And if their home isn't one of those places, knowing they have a space to go to where they can still be safe with masks or whatever, um, but also have access to these, um, to computers and paper and pencils um, and things like that. 
Thank you. Um, something, something we talked a lot about when we met before, and it hasn't really come up yet, is um, I know a lot of you are in um, your senior year, you're thinking about college, and you've had a lot of questions about, um, you feel like you don't know what the process is going to look like, what kind of help you're going to get, what the timelines are. Um, I'd love to hear you all share um, some of those questions and concerns for our audience. Um, I'm actually really uh, hopeful for the college, um, exploring college possibilities, career possibilities in our school. Um, one thing that probably won't have too much of an impact is the new um, career exploration and college exploration programs that we've put in place um, before we went on to remote learning. And we put it in place for this coming school year. So um, we've got a, a college and career exploration counselor and we've um, converted half of our library to um, an innovation center and we're um, really fortunate to be able to have that because I feel like especially in kind of unpredictable times like this students are even more unsure what they're going to be able to do after high school and how that looks for them. Um, so I think having that counselor and having people in that um, innovation center that will help us have that conversation and figure out what we want to do once we graduate will be something that isn't super affected and if it is I think it'll be um, a focus for the administration to keep that at least up and running for um, the seniors that are a little uh, concerned for how they're going to function after high school. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address this. Um, so my, this is not going to be my senior year also. So I have um, We also had um, a question come in just about the um, sort of the structure of um, So uh, Okay, so this is also gonna be my senior year. Um, and so I've been like thinking about colleges and it's kind of concerning like things with SAT and just testing like with grades because they're so important. Like um, it's just kind of really overwhelming because you don't know how everything's gonna go and like touring campuses and stuff isn't like a thing right now. And so it's just like um, college, like on top of high school, thinking about college at least is really overwhelming for me at least. Um, so yeah. That makes sense. And I apologize, you came in on a bit of a delay. So I apologize for, for almost cutting you off there. Um, does anyone else want to speak to this? Okay. Um, and then we also had a question about, um, you know, a lot a lot of people in the, in the spring felt like they didn't get enough live instruction and enough face time with their teachers. Um, but now we're starting to hear concerns that schedules are coming out that have students um, online for very long periods of time. And um, I'm just kind of curious, do you, have, like, what, like, do you have advice for teachers about what's the sweet spot? Like how long should an instructional video be? Would you rather um, watch them live or have a recorded video? How long would you spend on a computer every day if you were designing the schedule. Um, something that my school did uh, well was having it be kind of self-paced, but at the same time we did get live instructions and also recorded ones, uh, depending on which one uh, students tend to like more. Uh, is which one they'll go with because um, our school kind of shared the same instructional videos with our sister schools um, so it ended up being like where we would all have the same instruction and I think that um, making it self-paced where students can either stay with the live instruction or have pre-instructions already pre-recorded in our self-paced uh, modules or packets was super helpful um, just so that 
students can decide on how much time they need to spend on each thing. Um, Thank you. Um, other thoughts on that? So I think we're gonna um, we're gonna move towards closing this out. I want um, uh, we we had hoped to ask for some more um, feedback from our audience in terms of of sort of one takeaway that they had from this, and unfortunately um, we did have to close the chat. And again, I apologize for that. Um, we would love to hear from you if you could um, send us a note at community at chalkbeat.org um, and we'll be collecting your feedback there and and um, would love and plan to share that out with the students and with our and with our readers um, what sort of your takeaways from these events are from I'm sorry from this conversation is and I would like um, each of our students to go around um, with um, What's one thing that you hope that folks take away from this conversation? And I will start with you, Kelly, because you're the closest to me on my screen. Um, okay. uh, I hope that uh, people who watch this take away uh, communication with your students and uh, or students' families, and also just basically um, have compassion and empathy and understand that this is a hard time and we're going through it with you. So just patience and understanding that students might not always be there and motivated. So just communication. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Angie? I hope that the people take away that there's a lot of students that really care about what's happening and um, really care about how we're going to be going into school and are nervous and I think like they take into consideration that any um, unenthusi unenthusiasm they might face and stuff like that is probably students that are just um, really scared and uncertain for their futures because we are still operating under a pandemic and um, school is really important but there's a lot of issues that our um, students are facing directly that they feel has impacted their life more probably. And so just really take away that um, while all this is going on, there are a lot of students that really do care about their education um, and are gonna be trying their hardest, I guess, um, even though it's remote and there's probably gonna be also a lot of students that um, just don't have the motivation to participate at their 100% because of all the issues that are um, unfolding in these times. Thank you. Amy? Um, I, I want people to take away that students should be part of the conversation as well. And that um, it shouldn't be down to the administration or the parents or the teachers, how um, our education is conducted. Uh, we need to be part of the conversation as well because we bring a different input and a different um, opinion on how this affects us. And I'm not saying we need to be in completely in control, but we need to be able to collaborate and figure out what, what's best for all of us and um, that's something we really struggled with once and online learning came on was that we didn't much we didn't have much of a voice and we want to we need a voice in, in the midst of all this thank you um omar what's what's one thing you'd like our, our audience to take away today uh, like like what Kelly was saying, uh, I think the audience should take away like just like that teachers and like just the staff and administrators need to have empathy for the students and just like be like just put themselves in our position. And I think that way in our perspective, they could just see uh, we have a solution to this problem, we have a solution to this problem. And I think it'll just like, it'll just keep taking us steps forward instead of going back. And 
student because they don't really like live as a student like living in this time so i think if they see it from our perspective if they understand it and like we get a seat at the table i think that could be a really uh, a big step forward thank you angel Um, something I feel that people should take away from this is that um, I think like Kelly mentioned, it's a lot going on and we should just have compassion for not only teachers but students too because like she said, we are going through this with you and it's like a lot of uncertainty and we should just keep an open mind and let student voices be heard so that we know that the decisions we are making are best for both students, teachers, parents, and families. Thank you for that. Um, Ashley, what's one takeaway you'd like our audience to have? Um, I think similar to what everyone else was saying, the biggest takeaway that I would have to say is um, allowing students to have their voices heard and allowing students to be listened to, um, not personally asking your own students what they feel is the best that they need, like allowing students that you have to speak for themselves not necessarily having what we said speak for them. I feel like allowing everyone to have their voices is one of the most important parts. Also, um, having more conversations about social issues that are currently happening. Um, I know that's a very difficult thing to really take on right now, um, but I feel like there's many issues that we simply are ignoring and many issues that we as students have voices and opinions on yet aren't heard. So I feel like there's many takeaways, but really listening and understanding what your students need. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sierra? Yeah, I feel like I agree with everything that everybody has said so far. I feel like the biggest takeaway I would wanna give is that we're basically all in this together and we're all going through the same thing. And I feel like if we all go at our, like, our own pace, it would be better and it would just be better for everybody's mental and things like that. Thank you. And um, Zoe, are you still with us? Were you able to get back in? Um, I want to I want to really thank our panelists again for sharing their time and their expertise. Um, I really I really appreciated it, and I know that our audience did too. Um, thank you to um, Colorado Youth Congress and YASPA, the Gates Family Foundation, and Colorado Education Initiative. And um, again, for our audience, if you could share a takeaway with us at community at chalkbeat.org, we would really appreciate it. And I'm going to pass it to Anna Soler of the Gates Family Foundation for our final closing remarks. Hola a todos. Thank you to everybody who attended the call. We had over 170 people tune in. And when we first listening in for the students, and I want to thank each and every one of you for that. We also unfortunately had um, some cowardly postings in the chat box that were um, not supportive. And now more than ever, and is exemplified by just that incident, we really want to encourage people to support all of our students with all different types of lived experiences. And in particular, in these times to support the Black Lives Matter movement and the students who, as Ashley pointed out, are dealing with so many social issues that are taking a lot of space, a lot of energy, a lot of that mental space. So I want to commend these students for sticking in with the call, even though some unkind things were posted. You all are amazing and strong, unbelievable, um, completely inspired by your words and the fact that you took the time to be a part of this. For those of you who listened in, um, I want to also ask, as Erica did, that you take a moment to email us with some ideas or thoughts that you might have based on what you heard. Um, we would love to have some kind of a follow-up conversation or, uh, dare I say, call to action to move forward with some of these amazing suggestions. Um, 
that that's all I've got. I want to thank uh, YASPA, Colorado Youth Congress, Colorado Education Initiative, and Chalkbeat for your wonderful support. And I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you.